So I thought we should start today by reviewing yesterday to make sure that we've understood and understood what we talked about yesterday and perhaps maybe get more clarity and more depth before we go further. So the way I'd like to do this is to ask you to share something that you remember from yesterday's class. And if you like, it's not working. If you like, you can also um, share realization. Like this. You applied anything this morning to your channel? Or you had any specific realization? So all you have to do is raise your hand. And if you don't raise your hand, you will be called upon. <laughs> so it's easier if some brave soldiers raise their hand. Anything that you remember from yesterday? Any little or big point? Yes. Uh, to me, the most important point was that uh, we get often two times we get into more more of a process which have not relationships. So, so, yes. yeah. Today. So, it worked. Yeah. yeah. Until I remember. Yeah. Um, process versus relationship. So we. Because our relationship with Krishna isn't fully manifest, we have to practice <coughs> chanting in the proper mood because we don't always have the proper mood. So the practice is to be in the mood, to get in the right mood. That's what Pantanjali says. Um, practice means concentration, focus, determination with the right mood. So we talked about that mood yesterday, which is chanting is a relationship, not a process. But we have to remind ourselves. When I was young, many, many years ago, maybe you had this experience when you, when you're about to do something, whether it's a sport or if you're a salesman, you're going to go out and sell something, you're going to ski down a mountain, you're going to um, surf a 50-foot wave, you're going to climb a mountain, you're going to do something, you're going to give a lecture. Sometimes you know you're going to do well because you're in the right mood. You have that experience? You just feel it. You like you're in the mood. You know. You just know it's going to be good. Or you're in a band and you're going to play, and you're in the mood. And you know tonight we're going to blow the roof off this place because we're all in the mood. Right? So when you're in the mood, the right mood, when you chant your rounds, it becomes something similar. It just flows. But sometimes we're not in that mood, and so we have to. As weird as this sounds, we have to try to create that mood, evoke the mood. Because we forget. So that's part of sadhana. Even though that sounds strange, part of sadhana is to practice the mood, because we may not naturally have it. And that mood is, I'm trying to connect. Yes, that's a very important point. This is, I think, one of the biggest problems people have, especially those who don't like chanting. They've divorced themselves from that mood that I'm connecting to Krishna. And then, as we said yesterday, the focus becomes on, I have to hear, I have to sit, I have to pronounce. That becomes the main objective of their job, not their relationship. Those things can foster, but it's not the relationship. It's different. Did any of you else, any of you chant this morning in that mood? Relationship versus process? Did you try it out? Yeah. What happened? really amazing that you're sitting in front of me. And it was really quite amazing. Like, my focus was much stronger than usual. 
but yeah, he is sitting in front of us. It's actually, you know, yeah, we have to imagine it. We have to imagine it, but it's actually happening. <laughs> it's kind of funny. You know? That's just our condition. You know? It's like we said yesterday, you have to treat the deity as Krishna. Because you may not see that, but you have to treat him that way. So, okay, I have to imagine Krishna's here. This is the same. But the fact is, what we're imagining is what's actually is. Anyone else? Yes. I started chanting before going into the temple, and when I sat down, I thought, ah, the Buddha really said you should try this exercise. So I stopped chanting and did the heavens and the knees, and I started seeing how I felt, and I was wondering, okay, well, I'm really in the mood to chant. And I was thinking, I wonder if that's just because you said I must do this. <laughs> but it changed the, the, the two mantras I'd done before that. Afterwards, there was much more feeling. Nice. In, in Why do you think that? Just because you were, you automatically got in that mood. Yeah. Well, this is a really important point. This is a, a problem that I've seen. Is because chanting is a connection with Krishna. Sometimes we have a problem that when we begin to chant, we don't make any adjustment. Like, if, let's say you go on the altar. As soon as you go on the altar, your consciousness adjusts, doesn't it? It's like, okay, this is Krishna. And Prabhupada said, you know, we have to be very careful with Krishna. So we're on the altar, we're very careful, right? There's a shift. That same shift is supposed to take place when we chant. Like, okay, now we're chanting. This is connection, this is Krishna. And one of the problems that devotees have, especially when devotees say, I can't control my mind, part of the reason, or a big part of the reason is, when they began chanting, they didn't make the shift. So normally during the day, our mind is, you know, they say 30, 40, 50, 60,000 thoughts. So if you do the math, that's like one thought every three seconds or something. So the mind, as we know, it's going very quickly to many things. And so if we start chanting, but we don't make a shift, usually what happens is nothing, basically. It's just the same thing. Nothing shifted. There was no mood shift. It's just the same thing, and then we begin chanting. So if you make a little shift that now this is like deity worship, I'm worshiping Krishna, the name is coming, relationship, and so, so forth, one of the things you find is that you don't have so much trouble controlling your mind. And the reason, a lot of the reason we have trouble controlling our mind is we haven't made a shift. And the mind is used to just not being controlled. Right? Like, when you're chanting your rounds, sometimes you may think of things that are not happening right now, things you have to do, or things not related to japa. Yes or no? Yes. Why does that happen? Because we haven't made the shift. Like when you're dressing the deities, are you thinking about what you have to do at 3 o'clock? Generally not. And if you do, it immediately you'll catch yourself. Right? Actually, when the deities are present, the deities will catch you. Yeah, it's just so awkward to be anything but present with the deity. So if we take that same consciousness when we're chanting, then I'm with Krishna. There's a shift, and so your whole life just turns off. The reason our minds are so hard to control when we're chanting is because our life is still active. We haven't turned it off. We haven't made that shift. Right? Now, think about what you do when you watch a movie, and you really get absorbed in it. To get absorbed in a movie, basically your whole life gets shut off. And you're now, in that reality, you forget your reality. Now, wouldn't it be nice to go into the Krishna Leela reality when you chant and forget this reality? Well, that's what a pure devotee does. They're not actually present in the space that they're in, they're present in the Leela. So obviously we can't do that fully, but we can do it a little bit by turning all these other things off in our life and begin chanting. So you don't have to be a great devotee to do this. You don't have to be some rasic devotee. But if you do this, you'll see your absorption level goes way up because you've turned off the distractions. And that's why we have to rewrite the Padma Prana to add the 11th offense. 
which is to have your phone on when you're chanting. Because your life is in your phone. And that phone is what binds us to this existence we live, right? Because everything is there, isn't it? Basically, our whole life is on our phone. So if you have your phone on when you're chanting, then you're very connected to your life, isn't it? So that's the eleventh offense. You can write that. Tell your guru, uh, uh, Muhammad Prabhu is bogus. He told us there's eleven offenses when there's only ten. Yeah, no, that's the eleventh. Well, that's part of the tenth offense: distraction, inattention. But does that make sense? That, that if you leave things hanging in your life when you chant, those things will hang around your job. If you go to study. And you go into a library, the idea is that in the library, nothing else is going on. So, you know, your friends may be going to the movie having fun, whatever. When you walk into the library, you kind of forget that within a few minutes. You have to. That's what you're working on. So, that's the same with Japa. And this may sound simple, but most of the problem with the mind during Japa is simply because we haven't shifted our mood and we've left all the lights on in all the rooms of our life. And if you just turn them off, you won't have so much trouble with your mind because the lights are off. And that's why sadhus used to chant in caves. <coughs> so if you could kind of internally go into a cave, you'll find it much easier. So this is really important. Don't just grab your beads and schnick schnick your way through 16 rounds, but you know, Realize, <clears throat> see it kind of like going on to the altar, you know, and then get in that mood, turn your phone off, <clears throat> put everything on your life on hold, it'll all be there in two hours when you finish your japa. And if you can chant japa and actually disconnect a little bit, even forget where you are, then you'll see that you'll start to get something from the Holy Name maybe you've never gotten before, because you've given your <clears throat> attention to the Holy Name, instead of giving your attention to all the things going on in your life. The interesting thing about the mind, we have many thoughts, you know, we say my mind, it's difficult to control, but actually, don't look at it as your mind difficult to control, look at what you're giving attention to, because there's so many things in your mind going on. What are you giving attention to at that moment? Oh, I have so many bad thoughts. Yeah, you have so many good thoughts. Which thoughts are you giving attention to? The good ones or the bad ones? You don't have to give attention to the bad ones. They tend to grab you. But we tend to give attention. Right? So, if you can be more in control of your attention, what do I want to give attention to when I chant Champa? Not what I have to do later, not what I didn't finish yesterday, not creative ideas about my new project or this and that. But I want to give attention to what? The relationship. That's what I need to give attention to, right? So, now, you come and see me. You want to talk to me, you want some guidance. So I'm there with you, I'm listening. If I'm not listening, you'll be offended, right? You're talking and I'm on my phone. How would you feel? You'd feel pretty offended, especially if you're paying me $100 an hour. You'd feel really <laughs> offended. <laughs> So, one of the offenses is inattention, and inattention is described as giving attention to material things. So now there's Krishna and I'm not giving him my attention. So if you can just prepare yourself <coughs> by removing the things that are not necessary for your chanting, getting in this mood of this is a relationship and beginning japa, you will see that controlling your mind is much less of an issue and you'll realize the reason your mind jumps around is because you you didn't turn the lights off. You left them all on, so your mind is just going room to room. So we have to do later, and this project, and this devotee said something pretty nasty yesterday, and so your mind, your attention is just going one room to another. You know, you can curse that devotee after your job, but don't think about it while you're chanting. Hopefully you won't want to curse them after. But you understand, we have all these different rooms, right? Isn't it? So that's a really important point. And if, um, if you just sit there with your beads, get into the mood, and then you feel, okay, now I'm in the mood, then do it. What will happen to you, which is one of the most amazing things, 
If you practice that, after a while you won't have to do that. Immediately when you touch your beads, you'll go into that mood. Like immediately, you just touch it. You'll touch your bead, and because that's the mood you create every morning, you'll anchor that mood in, and touching the beads anchors that mood in. Yeah? Wouldn't that be nice? Because you've worked on that mood, you're so much into this when I chant japa, its relationship, that as soon as you put your hand in your bead bag and you touch your first bead, all the lights just shut off automatically in your life and you're there with Krishna. Wouldn't that be nice? No effort. Well, that's what will happen. But you have to practice it. Because that's what japa is. Right? If japa is just 16 rounds with all the lights on in your life, you're not going to really experience what, what the taste of the holy name is. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is such... If you do this, you'll find it's so easy to control your mind, because your mind has nothing, has no room to go to. So your mind will just go, okay. It'll say, your mind will say, turn some lights on, they go, no, not for two hours. And, and you'll, you'll get in this habit, and after a while, it just becomes natural. Is that good or good? <laughs> you see, <clears throat> anything you do consistently creates some scars, creates impressions. Some scars is another word for habit. So if we consistently chant bad rounds, what happens when you put your hand on that bead? It anchors in all the bad habits of, of Okay, Sun, subcon you don't realize this is happening, but subconsciously when you touch your beads, you'll go into the mood you were in yesterday, the day before, the day before, the day before. And if that mood was scattered, you might, by touching your beads, become more scattered than you actually are. Because you've anchored in, that's how I chant. It's a habit. That's unfortunate, isn't it? You realize that happens sometimes? For some of us, it's, you know, every this ecstatic kirtan, and we soon, as soon as I put our hand on our beads, our energy level drops. Oh no, this is really hard. You can see the body just go down. It should be the opposite, right? That, you, you know, you put your hand in your bead and all of a sudden this energy comes and you look blissful and go, wow, this is really good. So, if we can get to that point, then we create a, a program, and so as soon as we touch our beads, that program goes off. And the program is what uh, that program helps us. Otherwise, the program is working against us. What we do at our Java retreats, which go at least five days, is we're reprogramming, reprogramming our Java blueprint. That's exactly what we're doing. We come in with a certain blueprint, and that blueprint more or less determines the level of our Java, because the blueprint is like setting a thermostat. You set it to a temperature. And that's where it goes. So we have that blueprint. So we re we're reprogramming it. So we come out with a better blueprint. And hopefully that blueprint remains consistent. Now, you've seen this blueprint, either in yourself or others. But especially if you have the privilege to be around devotees who have a taste for japa, you'll see every day they have a taste. It's not like one day they're bored and one day they're relishing. You'll see every day. Very consistent, isn't it? It's just that's their blueprint. Does that make sense? Yes. Some devotees who have <coughs> who do some uh, important service, like for example doctors or counselors, <coughs> and they cannot turn their cell phones off given a job, what they should do. <laughs> what they should do? Um, um, oh, what they should do is they should have other doctors, each, each you know, doctor takes one day. So at least you have six days peacefully. And one doctor takes all the calls one day, so everyone can chant. Yeah. And if you're a counselor, no crisis is before 7 a.m. You know, if you had a job as a counselor, you wouldn't work before 7 a.m. I mean, unless it's suicide or something. Yeah, a lot of doctors do that. They go on vacation and they 
another doctor takes their pulse. As far as possible, you want to create that space where you're not disturbed. Because you see, if you allow yourself, if you're open, if you're an open target, then it's very difficult to control your mind because people will take advantage or just in your mind you're maybe expecting possibly you'll get a call checking your phone every once in a while so you're just making it hard on yourself no one who's um, advanced in japa really does that and, and you can just notice senior devotees who are relishing their japa you, you can see pretty much their world is turned off when they change up you can say pretty much they, you know, they're not really connected on the physical level. That's really good japa. You forget where you are. And it gets better if you forget you have a body. <laughs> then you know you're doing really good. Well, I completely forgot I had a body for the last two hours. I was, I was in Vrindavan. So, so um, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, for the pure devotee, they go into Lila when they chant. That's where they are. Now, you may have gone, you may have heard some devotees say, well, in order to control your mind, just have a piece of paper, and when you get all these fantastic ideas how to save the world in 18 days, you write them down. You know, I used to say that, but I realized that that's leaving the lights on. Then you're, you're chanting idea, write it down, chanting idea, write it down. It's not really what it's supposed to be. Not ideal. Yes. Yesterday you explained that we should put the hand in the deep bag, but no, no chance of chanting. Yeah. I did that this morning. What happened? So, uh, I felt I'm sitting on the table, but I can chant in the bowl down for the name. But then I messed it up. Why? Because you said also that you should invite Krishna to come with us, walk with us. I start to think that. Oh, how can you do both? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I'll give you a little tip. Chanting is, um, it's really a prayer, it really comes from the heart. So sometimes we teach devotees how to pray when they chant. And then they're chanting and they're thinking, am I praying properly? And they say, as soon as you ask that question, the answer is no, you're not. Because now you're observing. So as soon as you ask the how, you've lost it. So it's more of a mood than a particular process. So, um, if you ever ask the question, am I doing it properly? How should I do it? Is this right or wrong? You've lost it. Because now you're just in your mind. And you've divorced from your chanting. So, um, I don't want to sound like a cult leader, but think less and feel more. That will help your chanting. This chanting is not, it's not a thinking process. Maybe you could think, wow, how amazing it would be if Krishna were here with you. He actually is, I don't realize it. See, Buddhism has a principle called mindfulness. And mindfulness is very interesting because mindfulness simply means to experience something that's happening that you may not have been aware of previously and allow yourself to be more aware of what's happening. Let's say like you have a relationship with your wife and by practicing mindfulness you might be more aware of the affection she has for you in a way you've never been aware of it before although it's been there. So mindfulness is like bring awareness to what's already there. So Krishna is already there, it's just bringing awareness to it. It's not like creating something new. It, or, it, it is, I'm just not aware of it. So Krishna is with you when you chant, so bring more awareness to that. Not thinking, how is awareness that he is? That was kind of what we were saying yesterday. Like, Krishna is his name. Maybe we can't figure that out, 
but we just have to bring awareness to the fact that it is and treat it that way. So it's more of an experience than an analysis. Yeah. So as soon as you have to ask the question, am I chanting properly, the answer is always, no, you're not. Am I doing what Mahaprabhu said? No, he said that you should feel it. Am I feeling it? Actually, I don't really have feelings. I don't even know what feelings are. What are feelings? I mean, I'm a man. I don't feel my feelings. That's the problem. So we're, we're trying to analyze, analyze a relationship. I mean, you can analyze it, you know, through Shastra and so on, but not the way we would do it in the conditioned state. So it's good to practice mindfulness and japa, just become aware of what's already there. Like for example, it's common devotees will say, well when I chant I don't feel anything. I always joke with them and say, well, how does that feel? <laughs> how does it feel not to feel anything? It feels pretty bad. Yeah, you cannot not feel, can you? So, um, I don't feel anything, to which I, I answer, just try to feel what is already there that you're not feeling. Because Prabhupada said, you can feel Krishna in the holy name. So the feeling's there, but my attention is not there. So mindfulness is to put my attention on what is. So allow yourself to feel the holy name. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to know any shlokas. You don't have to mentally adjust. Just feel it. Now for a lot of us, that's way too simple. Prabhu, can you give me something more esoteric? Something more complicated than just feeling? No, but that's... That's for some devotees, it's way too simple. Just, just feel what I'm, just feel it, yeah, just allow yourself to feel Krishna's presence. Because he's there, right? And I'm not feeling. So bring awareness to that. It's quite simple. So we don't have to complicate it. Yes? It seems funny that we, you know, actually we have so many questions about Japa, but, uh, you know, when you really absorb this as a group, when you think of a movie, or if you stick with a person, you don't write the thoughts down, you know, you don't think how I get focused, you just you focus yeah. because yeah. there's a relationship. Yeah. So basically, what what you said, this is the, the only fix. You need to start working on relations and then all the thoughts will not come. It's, it's simple. Yeah, it's very simple. That's why I have a problem when people talk about controlling the mind during japa. Because Bhakti Minot Thakur said you can't. You know, okay, so Prabhupada said hear and listen. But to me, hearing is a total absorption in an experience, a feeling. And so many devotees have expressed their realizations, express it in terms of feeling. And I found that when you connect with a relationship and express the emotions we discussed yesterday, you don't have trouble with your mind. But if you try to battle head on with your mind, it's really difficult. And then your whole japa becomes a battle and after 16 rounds you're like, well, that's over. That was a tough fight. And I actually heard four mantras. 1,728. I almost heard about six more hours of struggle. So then, if you do that, why would you want to chant every day? Because it's just a mind battle. So, that is like, that's so 70s. <laughs> you know, that was like, Tough, rough, tough 1970 brahmacharis <laughs> chanting japa with their books <laughs> over there. Ready, ready, Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Beat the mind, beat the mind, Krishna, Krishna. You know? So that's not really what it's all about. I mean, that might be there in the beginning for some devotees, but that's not really where we want to go. It's not a battle with the mind, because it'll exhaust you. But as soon as you connect to the relationship and connect to the fact that Krishna's there, it becomes very easy. Just be aware of what's happening. Right? 
like when you're with the deities, you try to bring that awareness, isn't it? That Krishna's there. So why not do that with the holy name? Same thing, isn't it? As I said yesterday, I think the worst thing that can happen to devotees is to not chant properly and thus not get a taste. Because the taste is what's going to keep us going. And to have to struggle day after day is sad, because it's not necessary. Right? Yeah, it's hard. And there's so much power in the Holy Name, so much purification that you get. So when you chant it properly, it's amazing the realizations you get, and the strength you get, and the taste you get. I had this uh, very interesting experience. It was quite funny, actually. I had the fortune of doing maybe three japa retreats, you know, five days each, like within like a month and a half. It's like, you know, go up really high, just about when I'm kind of come down, the next retreat comes, they go up even higher, just about when I'm come down, the next retreat comes. And I'm one of the facilitators, so it's even more potent as a facilitator because you have to, you have to live it, right? So when I, after like the third retreat in such a short period of time, I actually felt like Maya cannot touch me. <laughs> I, was, I had no worry about it. So I didn't even know what Maya was. I hadn't seen her in weeks. <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. And so I met a god brother, and he says, and he said, how are you doing? And I said something like, well, I can't remember exactly what I said. I said something like, yeah, I don't know what Maya is. I haven't seen her in a while. And he's like, God, you're puffed up. <laughs> and I, I didn't, you know, I didn't mean it that way. I, did, I was just meant it honestly. That, that that's how I was feeling. And it came off like you're so puffed up. But the point is that, that if you take the holy name properly, that's what happens. You just like Maya is just not. A, it's not an issue in your life because the holy name is so powerful. That's my experience. And that's why um, it saddens me when devotees don't have a taste and they're just struggling through it because I know they're not getting that full power that the Holy Name will give. And they're maybe even imparting some kind of negative samskar towards the Holy Name. You know, I have to chant. I don't like it. I just do it out of duty. You know, if I didn't have to, I wouldn't. That's very sad. Yeah. Once I experienced that you know, pleasure of chanting more and more, then it made me very sad to see devotees not getting it. And it's very easy not to get. And the holy name can defeat Maya. So where's Maya going to go when she wants to pull you away from Krishna? She'll go for your japa. She'll keep you away from kirtan and keep you away from japa, good japa. If you chant good japa and have good kirtan, she can't do anything. So that's where she's going to attack. So that's a, uh, a saying I have. Maya is after your japa. She's looking for your japa and she wants to distract you. Because if she does, you'll be in Maya. So watch out. She's after your japa. When you're chanting japa, look around. She's coming. She's going to try to get you. So what else did we discuss yesterday? Actually, we didn't discuss anything. Okay, now I have to reveal for all of you who teach a teaching technique. We basically only discuss one thing, didn't we? More or less. Process versus relationship. Why did we only discuss one thing? I mean, I said many things, but they all supported one thing, because that one thing is so important. I really wanted you to get this. Because if you get this, this job is going to be very easy. And uh, I also said that when we take it as a process, then we don't treat Krishna as Krishna in his name, and that becomes, that becomes cause of uh, so many problems in, in offenses. Okay. Any questions or any other comments that I made that you want to bring up?
Also for the benefit of those who weren't here yesterday. Okay. Now, we're going to talk about the concept of aparad. Very interesting concept. Aparad means offense, as you know. So, Now, first, <clears throat> I know when we talk about offenses, whether they're to Vaishnava or the Holy Name or the Dham or the Deity, the concept is, um, it can make us feel a little bit guilty or feel bad, because the word offense is a very heavy word. You know what the word offense means? <laughs> means to hurt someone, to upset someone, to disturb someone, to make someone angry. So then we say, that's an offense to Krishna. That's like very heavy. I just upset Krishna. Or I upset my guru. Or I upset a Vaishnava. Or now I'm committing offense to the holy name. Krishna in the form of his name I'm upsetting. So, you know, the connotation is can make you feel pretty bad, or pretty depressed, or guilty, isn't it? So, I would like to preface that by a statement we made yesterday, maybe it wasn't uh, one of the main things we were talking about. We did mention yesterday that it's not an offense if we're trying to avoid, at least it's not an offense to the Holy Name if we're trying to avoid making an offense. If I do something that offends you, even though I'm not trying, it's an offense because you were offended. But if I offend the holy name, but I'm not trying to offend, I'm trying to avoid the offense, that is the definition of Namabhad, chanting with an effort to avoid the offenses. That's the definition. So it's not Namaparad if you're trying to avoid the offenses. So when we talk about offenses, keep that in mind, because I don't want everyone to get depressed and not come back tomorrow. Because we spent the whole day talking about offenses, and you realize I'm an offender. So, you know, I'm going to look, you know, I'm going to climb up to the top of the tower, of, you know, get a little rope and just jump. You know, because I'm such an offender, what's the use? Um, in a sense, it's normal to be an offender because we're conditioned souls, but we can make an effort to avoid the offenses, and we may not be perfect in avoiding them, but at least we're trying. So I want you to keep that in mind, otherwise this discussion could be very depressing. Why depressing? Because nam aparad, what nam aparad means? It means an offense directly to Krishna. That's heavy, isn't it? To offend God, that's very heavy. To offend God in the form of His name, it's very heavy. And the Shastras and the Acharyas say, it is heavy. It is really heavy. Because it's the name that excuses us from all sins and offenses. And then if we offend the very name that's excusing us, that's heavy. Isn't it? So, I mean, I have to, I want to emphasize the heaviness of it, but I don't want to um, depress you. This okay. So, before I came, I went on Google, and I looked up the word offense, just because we're going from Sanskrit to English. And then I looked up, or I've, I've studied the meaning of aparad, the etym etymology, etymology of it. So we're going to compare it in Sanskrit to English, and it'll be interesting. So, one meaning of offense, it's a legal term. You break the law, that's considered an offense. And, right? You go to court, for this offense, 10 days in jail, or two weeks community service offense. So they look at it as offense as breaking the law. You did something against the law. That's an offense. So that's one meaning of offense. But it's not exactly the meaning that we're using. Although 
it, it could be. You know, I'm turning, I'm turning against Dharma. So that's an offense. But this is personal. That it makes it different when it's personal. So the more personal <coughs> definition means to hurt, upset, get angry, or not show regard to someone. So sometimes we'll say, you want to tell somebody something, and you say, no offense, but I really didn't like those chapatis. <laughs> no offense, but I think your wife needs to learn how to cook. <laughs> you know, we say like, in other words, no offense means I don't mean to want to make you angry, upset, hurt you. So that's, that's the meaning of offense. So, uh, so now if we apply that meaning to Namaparad, an offense to the holy name means to hurt Krishna. Something that hurts Krishna, that upsets Krishna. Right? That's the meaning of Nama Parad. Krishna is his name. So if you offend the name, you've offended Krishna. So you've hurt, upset, made angry, or disregarded Krishna. It's a personal thing. Again, not a process. Nama Parad. It's not, oh, I made an Aparad to the process. I didn't, I wasn't facing east, I was facing west. It's not like that. No, you actually hurt the heart of Krishna. That's why it's heavy. And I don't think we realize how heavy Nam Aparad is. And I hope by the end of this week, I scare you to death that you'll never make another Nam Aparad because you realize how much it hurts Krishna and how bad it is if we're trying to develop a relationship with someone to hurt them. Now, there's a principle in relationships that every time you do something nice for someone, it makes the relationship better. Every time you do something to hurt them, it makes the relationship worse. And what psychologists have said, it takes five nice things to counteract one hurt. So look at your relationship with Krishna, how many positives and how many operas. And so, you know, ideally we don't want to create any operas. Right? So we'll get into this later. But you get the basic idea? We're dealing personally here. And Krishna says this in the <coughs> Bhagavatam, that my heart, when you offend a devotee, you've offended my heart, because the devotee's in my heart. So it's very personal. So let's keep that in mind, because I want to try to help you become, <coughs> yeah, I guess, guard yourself by understanding the serious nature of it and how it's hurting Krishna and how we cannot advance by hurting Krishna's heart, just as you can't develop a relationship with anybody if you are hurting them, right? <clears throat> well, sometimes I counsel couples, and then sometimes they're in such a bad state that most of the time they argue. And I say, well, do you anything positive? And they think and they say, no. So where's that relationship going? There's nothing positive, only negative. So if all I'm doing is offending the holy name, day in and day out, and I'm scratching my head, I just don't understand why I have no taste for the holy name. And I'm offending Krishna. Right? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to get heavier than that. We're just warming up. Okay, so now we look at the um, the word aparadha. It's, it's composed of apa and radha or apa aradhana. Apa in Sanskrit means distance, separation, against. Like that. So there are actually many words in Sanskrit for, for offense. Because if someone acts improperly, that would be an offense. So there are words like apacharita, like, like improper action, that's considered offense. Apa, the, uh, against proper achar. Apa achar, against proper behavior, that's an offense, right? So that's, and there are many words in Sanskrit like that that say against proper action is an offense. But 
The word that our Shastras use is aparadha. So what's so heavy about that? Separation from radha. <laughs> that's what that's what aparad is. It's distancing. It's turning against. Apara, apa means without. Aparad means without radha. Pretty heavy, isn't it? So we're doing something um, that's distancing us from Radha. Our service goes to Radha. We can't approach Krishna without Radha. Radha is in charge of, she is the internal potency. She is Hare Krishna. Krishna, please awaken, uh, lift me. That's Radha. And now we're talking about Aparadha. We're doing something which is turning us away from Radha. That's Aparadha. Heavy, huh? And now, without Radha, how can we approach Krishna? You can't. She's in control. When I first joined, when they were shaving my head, they said, Radharani is very pleased that you're shaving up right now. And she's going to tell Krishna that you've become, Bhakta Martin has become a devotee. She's going to tell Krishna. And if she tells Krishna to show favor, he has to show favor. And that's what I was told the day they shaved my head. Pretty esoteric for 1970, huh? <laughs> But we understood that, that she occupies the realm of bhakti. So, aparadha means without radha. Against radha, distance from radha. Or aradhana means worship. So it's just another way of saying without worship without the internal potency. So what do you have? Not much, right? Okay. Um, um, I'll read something. So here are some other meanings of Radha. To please, affection, success, prosperity. So literally, nam aparad means to displease the holy man. That's another meaning. Aside from distancing from Radha. <laughs> to displease the holy name. So my chanting is displeasing Krishna if I'm committing offenses. That's pretty scary, isn't it? My chanting could displease Krishna. Okay. Um, now, hold on to your seatbelts. I mean, fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> this next statement is kind of scary. <laughs> this is from Jaiva Dharma. But I think this, is, this next statement is very important because if we get this, I think this can turn our japa around and our kirtan around. Offenses against the holy name are the most frightening of all sins and offenses. Should I read that again? Is that too depressing? Offenses against the holy name are the most frightening of all sins and offenses. All other sins and offenses go away naturally and automatically as one utters Hari Nam. But Nam Aparad does not go away easily. What does that mean? Someone like to explain? What did you just hear? Somebody tell me what you just heard. You cannot rectify Nam Aparad with chanting. Not easily. Because it's the worst offense of all sins. What it says right here, of all anything you could imagine sinful, and any kind of offense you could commit, nam aparad is the worst. Because as I said before, that name is the thing that can free us from all offenses and sins. And then if we offend the very name that can free us of all sins, there is no greater offense. It's a direct offense to Krishna.
You should be very careful. Should I read that again? No. <laughs> Let's have kirtan, right? We've had enough for today. I think this is one of the most important things that, that we're going to understand. Offenses against the Holy Name are the most frightening of all sins and offenses. All other sins and offenses go away naturally and automatically as one utters, utters Hari. But Nam Aparad does not go away easily. So, what it's saying is the offense has an effect on us and it takes time to overcome the effect so we don't want to infect the disease of Aparad because it, it doesn't go away easily. Whereas you commit some sin, you chant Hare Krishna, it's gone. Or some little offense here or there, it's gone. So Nam Aparad is the most serious of all offenses. But it has the most, it's the worst effect on us. Jiva Goswami, when describing the ten offenses, uses the word pasandi, godless. Pasandi literally means pasandi literally means one who misuses his body and property. And it is used here because chanting with offense leads to godlessness. I forget which of the offenses he was describing, but he used the word prashandi, which generally means agnostic or atheist. So saying offense will make one, will cause one to become godless. That's heavy. Nam Aparad is directly an offense against Krishna. It is so serious that once when Mahaprabhu was explaining the glories of the Holy Name, a student said, these are exaggerations. You know, it's one of the offenses. It's consider the Holy Name, the glories of the Holy Name to be an exaggeration. It's not actually true. You say the Holy Name gives you love of God, or gives you liberation or free from sin. That's just advertising. It's not true. That's just to motivate people to chant. But it's not true. So when Mahaprabhu was glorifying the Holy Name, then one student was listening and he said, this is exaggeration, this is not true. That's an offense to the Holy Name. Immediately Mahaprabhu ran into the Ganga with his clothes on and took bath. He said, why? He said, because I saw the face of an offender to the Holy Name. And he said, anyone who sees this person must immediately take bath. That's how heavy. That's how he saw someone who offends the Holy Name. But now I'm polluted. He's like, oh Prabhu, I'm not going in the temple room tomorrow. Of <laughs> if I do, I'm wearing blindfolds. <laughs> Isn't that heavy? Someone who is offending the Holy Name is so... It, it's so bad. Mahaprabhu said, nobody, if you've looked at this person, you have to go bathe. And if you haven't looked at this person, don't, don't look at him. Mm. How do we know our chanting is becoming free of offenses? Material desires reduce and attachment to Krishna increases. By offending the name, we lose taste and attraction for sadhana. In other words, we won't derive happiness from chanting. So, um, I'm going to skip ahead. Just divert for a moment. Because here it's mentioned, how do we know our chanting has become free of offenses? Because material desires reduce. And we know one of the ten offenses is to maintain material attachment. Right? So, um, is there anyone here that doesn't have any material attachments? Raise your hand. Okay, we all have material attachments. Right? So does that mean we're offenders? Because we're maintaining material attachments. Well, it might appear on the surface that that's what it means. We have material attachments. So because I have material attachment and I'm still attached, I just bought a new guitar and I'm really attached. I just got my new Murdunga and it's really good. I paid 2,000 rupees for it. 
you don't touch it. And it's got my new camera. It is really good. I'm really attached. And I just got my new Samsung ST2 whatever tab. And I'm really attached. So it's not exactly how you think it. Sanatana Goswami elaborately explains this principle that it means attached to things that are detrimental for your bhakti. It means attached to things that you can't use in devotional service. Uh, you have children. Are you attached to your children? If you're not attached to your children, we have to send you to a counselor. Right? <laughs> Something's wrong with you. You've been here in too many classes by sannyasis. <laughs> you're letting your children. You don't care anymore. Um, so, it's natural to be attached, but so the Sanatana Goswami says, attached in a way in which you fulfill your needs, but not more than you need, not more sense gratification than you need, attachment in a way that's not an obstacle. So we're all attached, right? So that's not an offense to the Holy Name, but it's an offense if we're remaining attached to things which are detrimental. Things we can't use in Krishna service, they're not good for us. That would be a symptom that we're making an offense or we've made an offense. So I just don't want you all, all to be depressed over the tenth offense to maintain material attachment. Because we're all a bit attached, right? You attached your necklace? Yeah, you are. It's a nice necklace. If I ask you for it, you won't give it to me. <laughs> but that's Juggernaut, so that's okay. Yeah. How interesting that um, basically what he wrote the course, how he goes about it. He says, offense is to think in terms of I and mine. That's offense. Yeah. Attached to the body, bodily conception. Yeah. So if you think it's mine, or you can say it's, it's Krishna's. Yeah. Then it's not at all. It's not. It's not what you possess or what you operate. But you False see, ego. it's False. mine. Yeah. yeah. And False that's, ego. That's yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Because one of the definitions is to think I'm the body. Sometimes instead of saying material attachment, attached to the ego of I'm the body, yeah. possession. Yeah. The ego possesses, identifies its mind. You know, one time Prabhupada showed his watch and he said, this watch belongs to Krishna, but if you try to get it from me, I won't give it to you. Because <laughs> I'm using it for Krishna. Although there's this really amazing story. Prabhupada had a simple watch and then um, someone came and, came and gave him a Rolex watch. So he gave the simple watch and then he put on the Rolex. And then right after that, sometime after that, someone came and gave him a Seiko watch. A Seiko watch was a few hundred dollars, Rolex is, you know, five thousand plus. So he took off the Rolex, gave it away, and then put on the Seiko watch. Mm -hmm. so, that's okay. That's not breaking the tenth offense. Yeah. Um, the point is that as conditioned souls, we will be attached, but can we use those attachments in the right consciousness and employ them in Krishna's service so they don't pull us away from Krishna? Then you're not committing offense, but if we're attached to something in either the wrong consciousness or to enjoy something beyond what we need, then that's the, that's the offense. And then that would be a symptom that our chanting is it's not being, it's being done with offense. Is that okay? So, um, I could say more, but why don't, why don't we stop and see if you have any questions. Or, or does anyone on the internet, there are questions coming up on the internet? Do you see anything? Yes. I have two questions. Okay. Hmm. First question is, uh, among 10 offenses, well, we have now 11 and so forth, so some, uh, some offenses are more heavier than others, yeah. so it means the reactions will be more grave yeah. and heavy. So, what are... What are the heaviest defenses? Yeah. On, 
I read four times Prabhupada said what the heaviest offense is. And each time he said a different offense was the most serious. So I can tell you those four. He said the first offense is the worst. Because if you offend a Vaishnava, you can destroy your body. Then he said the third offense is the worst. Because if you offend your guru, then you're finished. Then he says, the seventh offense is the worst. Because to commit sin on the strength of chanting is more sinful than the sin you committed. And that's the worst. And then, just the other day, for the first time I read, the second offense. And the interesting thing is we said yesterday, the second offense also means to think Krishna is different, his name is different from his body. So Prabhupada said that's the huge offense to think he's different from his body. So those are the worst offenses. Second question. So from the history, from the stories, the Chitanchi Vigamrita and other examples, we can see that one offense leads to another. It's like a snowball. It yeah. becomes a practically a person falling down and down. And only like special mercy of Krishna needs to put him out to yeah. some pure devotee. <coughs> So what they say, for example, in our case, because usually like if you reach Tanchari Damrita, it's a special jivas, they give us example, like the Lord himself helps to this, what about us, how... How we overcome the offenses? Yeah, sometimes it just, when a person commits offense, he doesn't realize, because... Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's a good question. How to overcome the offenses? There's something that you may not know, you know, every morning we pay obeisances to all the devotees. Well, we didn't do that in the beginning of the movement. And every time, in the beginning of the movement, like, there was like one sannyasi. Then in 1970, Prabhupada made like four sannyasis. So that was kind of, it's kind of an unusual thing for us. All of a sudden there were sannyasis. Aside from Kirtanananda, he was the first. Now there's four sannyasis. So we're told we're supposed to pay obeisances when you see a sannyasi, and if you don't, you have to fast that day. So I'm not that humble, but I like to eat, so I pay my obeisances. <laughs> so um, you know, so you see them going in the temple, pay obeisances. You see them coming out of the temple. And there's another one coming down the street. With the so it was awkward for both the devotees and especially for the sannyasis. They, they felt embarrassed. Everyone's paying obeisances. So they asked Prabhupada what to do. And Prabhupada said, okay, well, we can just have in the morning one, at one time, we'll pay obeisances and we'll cover it for the day. And then Prabhupada said at that time, he said, when you, after you recite the prayer, he said, you should pray, my dear Vaishnava devotees, if I have committed knowingly or unknowingly any offenses, please forgive me. At that time, you just clean the slate every day. And when you go on the altar, you do the same thing. So after you finish your rounds or before, you can do the same thing. My dear Lord, if I have committed any offense, please forgive me. Now, one of the most interesting things, I don't know if it's the most interesting, but something that's very interesting is that if you ask the average devotee about repentance, well, what do you call it in Catholicism when you, when you uh, conf confession? If you ask most devotees about confession, will say, do we have confession in Krishna consciousness? And most devotees will say, no, because it's not part of the, you know, it's not like at 7 o'clock you go in front of the deities and it's confession time. And every morning you go and you confess. Right? So most devotees would think, well, it's not really a practice we do. It's, that's a Catholic practice or a Christian practice. But it's not actually true. It's in Nectar Devotion. Under, I believe it's under the title Submission. And it talks about a devotee going in front of the deity, confessing all his sinful actions, all the sinful things he did. And he said, I'm embarrassed. He prays to the deity and said, I'm embarrassed to tell you all the sinful things I've done. And that is a process of confession. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, to become free from the offenses through the Holy Name, we should ask, we should confess, and with remorse, 
ask the Holy Name to forgive us and chant in remorse, which I think is significant, because it does say to become free from offenses, we should chant. But Bhaktivinoda Thakur there, there adds that we should chant with remorse, because how will you become free from the offense if you chant with offense? So there has to be some remorse. So that's the process of repentance to overcome any kind of offense. There must be remorse, asking forgiveness, and then rectification. So how can you ask for forgiveness and then continue to offend the Holy Name? It's not right. So if you want to feel remorseful, it's very powerful. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, we should feel remorseful. Krishna, I've offended the Holy Name. I've offended you. I feel bad. We should feel bad. If we don't feel bad, we should feel bad if we don't feel bad, that we don't feel bad, that we offended the Holy Name. Should I say that again? <laughs> we should feel bad if we don't feel bad that we offended the Holy Name. If, if we don't feel bad that we offended, that should make us feel bad, because we should feel bad. And that feeling bad is a protection against committing offenses. That's the idea. Because I think too many of us do not feel bad that we offended the Holy Name. Maybe, maybe we're not even aware how bad it is to offend the Holy Name or what the offenses actually are. But we should, it would be good if we do have a little remorse because it will chasten us and it will help us, prevent us from committing those offenses. So now every morning you could ask for uh, um, forgiveness from the Vaishnavas, from the Holy Name, from the Dham, whatever you want. That's always good. That's humility. Is that okay? Is that more than okay? Mm -hmm. Someone else had a... Yes? In these 35 years where I... Yes. Yes. How is that? Because you're trying to be Krishna conscious. And because you're trying, it's not counted as an offense. And you're, be, you're being also purified by that effort to want to counteract those offenses by being better. It's your, your sincerity is the thing that's saving you. And Krishna sees that. What should I do that I don't really <laughs> well, that's a good question. I'm going to give a very simple answer. This answer is so simple that everyone misses it. <clears throat> and you're going to think, when I give it to you, that I don't miss it, but we do. If I commit offense, it doesn't please Krishna. It displeases him. So let's say my offenses are small, and I think, well, my offenses are not so big, and I, I'm still living in Mayapur, Mahaprabhu hasn't kicked me out, I have service and so on. So everything's fine. But then we have to ask the question, is my chanting pleasing Krishna? And that's the whole point of bhakti, is to please Krishna. So it's not, it's like, you ever seen the t-shirt? What can I get away with and still go to heaven? What can I get away with and still go to heaven? Like what's the least I can do and still go to heaven? So, you know, we don't want that mentality. The, the, the simple point is bhakti means to please Krishna. So it's not like, oh, well, I'm okay. But is Krishna pleased with what you're doing? And a lot of times we don't think that way. Isn't it? My chanting's good enough, you know, I'm okay. Well, is Krishna, is Krishna pleased with it? My service is okay, is Krishna pleased with it?
I don't have a good relationship with this devotee, but it's okay, you know, because I'm still going on. Is Krishna pleased with that? If we thought more in terms of Krishna's pleased, it would help us a lot. And like I say, it's so simple, we don't think like that. It's like too simple, right? One devotee was having a problem. Uh, he said, I just can't forgive somebody. So she said, I'm going to speak with Bhaktivedya Purnaswami and get his advice. I said, well, you know, I teach forgiveness. I'd like to see what he said. She comes back. I said, what did he say? He said, you should forgive because it pleases Krishna. Like, how simple is that? And is there any better reason to forgive? Is there any better reason to do anything? Like, no. But like, duh. <laughs> like, how come I didn't think of that? I had this big problem I can't forgive, you know, five years going through my mind, you know. And then I get one answer. How do I forgive? I should do it to please Krishna. Oh, really? I never thought of that one. Isn't that amazing? You know, the, the solution to so many of our problems is just do it to please Krishna. And then we you know, I've been counseling for, you know, months and I don't get it. If I just get that, then... Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's not like, how much can I get away with? And still go back to Godhead. Like, like what's the minimum? Guru Maharaj, what's the minimum? Do I have to do this? Do I really have to get up early? Do I really have to do, you know, good round? Do I really have to read every day? I, want, I just need to know the bare minimum. Get through the gates. That's not the mood of bhakti. It's, what can I, Guru Maharaj, what can I do to please Krishna? That's the question. Isn't it? Yes? I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just now, as yes, you said that uh, we have to forgive. So even if we have forgiven them without even asking forgiveness, so what about how to forget that incidents that happen with so many devotees? It's severe, and whenever we see them, it, all things come up on the mind. You know, how to forget that incident? Because <laughs> Krishna is so beautiful, and he's has so many amazing qualities, and his pastimes are so wonderful, and his incarnations are so wonderful, leelas of his devotees are so wonderful that you'd rather think of that than think of that, how much that person hurt you. That's how you do it. And you make that decision. Do you want to think of this person and how much they hurt you for the rest of your life? Because you only have so much space in your minds and hearts. So when that, uh, that person occupies, then there's like no room for Krishna. Think of Krishna. No. You can't stop thinking of this person. There's no room for Krishna. <laughs> thinking about them. You don't realize what they did to me. You have no idea. We cannot let this go. This was unjust. This has to be rectified. How long have you been thinking about it? 21 years? There's still no justice. So at some point in your life, you're going to have to realize that if I do that, that person is just occupying my whole existence, and there's no room left for Krishna. You know another thing which Mahaprabhu taught, he taught that the heart is a sacred place. And you have to be very careful what you allow into your heart, because the heart is where Krishna is supposed to sit. And if you bring all this junk into your heart, then Krishna can't fit in there. He doesn't, or he doesn't want to come. Either there's no space, or he doesn't want to come, because it's so dirty. So, you know, you want to think of that person and how bad they were? Or do you want to be a humble Vaishnava? Now, here's some more bad news. You've probably heard the bad news before. One of the offenses, which we'll discuss another day, to a devotee is when you see them, you go, oh, they're so and so. Hope they don't see me. <laughs> That's an offense. It's described in this kind of Purana. You see another Vaishnava, and you're, and you're thinking, oh, God, that devotee. <laughs> That's an offense. That's a Vaishnava Parada. Then you're not happy to see that devotee. And you don't even have to see that devotee because that devotee lives inside you. So it's like one 
you know, resentment is like one constant Vaishnava Parad relentlessly. Isn't it? Does this devotee create some problem for you, harassing or something, and you're supposed to be happy to see? <laughs> well, we can broadly define happiness. Well, there is a way around this. You say, because of what they did, they're not a devotee. So the fact that I'm angry with them is okay because I'm not angry with the devotee. Now, that sounds funny, but it may be true in some cases. So, um, you know, if they're engaged in devotional service and uh, they did something horrible to you, if they're somehow or they're serving Krishna, somehow we have to get over it. What if it was the mood that, okay, I prefer that she or he will not see me, otherwise it will um, make them to uh, make offenses towards me, so yeah, and do okay. bad for them, so better be... Reason not to be happy. No reason not to be happy, other than I'm just proud. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, That's worse. Yeah. Yeah. Like a few times, and then you yeah. can avoid every time you see that person. Like, I mean, it happens to me. Like, and I get a bit upset, but she didn't yeah. do anything to me. But I saw something. Yeah. How to deal with that? Yeah, well, she's asking if if some if another devo if this person offended another person, then it upsets me. Um, I think it's the same answer. It's like. Do you want to dwell on that the rest of your life? I mean, obviously you'll be upset, but you'll have to be able to process it in some way. Now, if that devotee's, if you feel that devotee's going to hurt other people, you may want to do something. Um, it's, it's not that we're making something right by forgiving. But we're just trying to rise above. We're trying to buy, rise above passion and ignorance by continually just having very ill feelings towards somebody. Because it's not helpful for bhakti. I'll give you an example. This is this is nice. The other day I was saying that there's Vaishnava Aparad and there's Jana Aparad. Jana means person. So it's actually considered an offense, which is detrimental for your consciousness to offend anybody, not just the devotee. Um, and Shastra says to offend another person is a sin, so sin's a contamination, so a contamination will hurt us. Now, Jiva Goswami says something about charity, about giving charity just to ordinary people. Just like somebody's hungry and you feed them or you give them some clothes or something. So sometimes we think as devotees, well, it's mundane and we shouldn't do that. And Jiva Goswami said, if you give a poor person clothes or food or something, it may not be considered bhakti. He said, but it's good for your bhakti because it softens your heart and if you don't do it, your heart becomes hard. Isn't that interesting? So it's not directly bhakti, but it's an action which will either, by not doing, harden your heart or by doing will soften it. So I think it's the same thing. Okay, this person did something wrong, but if I don't let it go, it's going to be bad for me. Because I'm holding on to... Resentment is really tamaguna, so I'm, I'm connected with tamaguna right now. Okay, what they did is wrong, and it's understandable that I should feel bad, but I'm connected with tamaguna right now. That's the problem. So, it's a big challenge. <coughs> you actually understand what it means to be Krishna conscious, you might think it's impossible. But this is what we're supposed to be coming to at some point in our lives. To never say one bad word about any devotee. No matter what they say to us, no matter what they do. It's amazing, huh?
Anyway, think about it. Yeah. Uh, how does it work in family situations like, let's say you, you have a spouse or a father, mother or children or brother, sister, and you live in a community and somebody in the family is offending other people. Mm -hmm. So, what kind of roles do you work in? Um, depends on your position, but if you're in a position to protect other people, then that's your duty. See, here's where, where you get confused. In, in the situation you're presenting, let's say your mother is creating a problem for your wife. So it's your duty to protect your wife. It's a sensitive situation because you're supposed to respect your mother. But you have to protect your wife. Right? So if there's no vengeance towards your mother, there's no resentment, there's no anger, there's no hatred. So a devotee is meant to resolve these issues without descending into the lower modes of nature. So he stains sattvic, which means shanti shanti, peaceful, humble. But at the same time, there's the dharma that I am the husband, I have to take away. So the problem is that a lot of times when we look at a situation, we think we have to descend into the lower modes to deal with it. You can't be humble and deal with this because if you're humble, they'll push you over and like that. But that's not true. Maybe it's a false definition of humility. So the trick is to do what is dharmic at the same time not descend into the lower modes of nature. Do it in a sattvic way. So you have to you know, explain things to your mother that this is not working and we have to respectfully ask you not to do this in a humble way without, you know, with affection. So we're not used to doing that. We're used to kind of giving up that mode and just fighting fire with fire. Obviously, that statement doesn't apply to devotees. Because we fight fire with water. We fight passion and ignorance with Sattva Guna. When you try to fight it with the same Guna, then everybody descends to the lower mode. You know, fight fire with fire is probably more of a military application. But it's not really a Vaishnava application. Fight fire with water. Fight fire with a fire extinguisher. That's your compassion, your kindness, your understanding. General. Unless, you know, unless we're dealing with the outside world, sometimes we have to be as aggressive as they are. But amongst Vaishnavas, we're supposed to fight fire with a fire extinguisher, not with fire. Yes? It's a question on the internet. Okay. How do we get to the place where we want to please Krishna sincerely rather than ourselves? How do we get to the place where we want to please Krishna sincerely rather than please ourselves? It, Remember, I think it was yesterday, I was saying that, uh, no, no, it was two days ago, Sunday night we were giving class, and we were talking about what sincerity means, and sincerity means to serve Krishna for his pleasure. And so one devotee was saying, I don't think I was sincere when I joined, I think I joined to get something. And I was saying, we all joined to get something, but after a few weeks in the temple, we learn that that's wrong. We learn that we're supposed to please Krishna. So in the beginning it's more of a theory that this is what I'm supposed to do. So we, we just think in terms of is this going to please Krishna or not. Not that the heart's there, but the understanding's there. What was the question? How do I get to the point of being yeah. You get to the point of doing of, of getting there by first doing it, even though it's not natural. And that's Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. You do things that are not natural. Okay, I'll do this because it pleases Krishna. I don't really want to do it, but I practice it. That's why. And then the taste comes. Every morning when your alarm goes off, the first thought should be, if I get out of bed now, this will please Krishna. I don't want to get out. But if I get out, Krishna will be pleased. Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, that back in the day, maybe you've experienced this, in some ashrams, 
there was no hot water. The hot water knob was unscrewed and you could not get any hot water. And these are in cold countries. And you'd have to go in there in the morning and think, this cold shower is going to please Krishna. <laughs> they interviewed a monk. 25 years he takes a cold shower every day. So they interviewed him and said, so we've heard, every day of your life, every morning you take a cold shower. How is that? He says, that's true. Every day for the last 20, he's a Buddhist monk, every day of the last 25 years, I've taken a cold shower and I still hate it. <laughs> so, but it pleases Krishna, so I, well, it pleases Buddha. I still do it. So that's the idea. <laughs> Last verse of Shishashtakam. Uh, in the purports there, following that verse, what is it said? If Radharani, if her suffering will please Krishna, that's her greatest pleasure. So we're supposed to understand. If I can do something that doesn't fulfill or fill my sense gratification, but it pleases Krishna, that should be my great happiness. That's the idea. At least we understand that and then we practice it. Then maybe someday we'll get a little taste. Because if it's not Krishna's senses we're going to please, it's ours. And we've been trying to please our senses for unlimited lifetimes and it doesn't work. So. We're supposed to learn that. Yes? If it works, it would have worked already. Yes? Yeah. Can you please explain again how to turn on the lights? Turn off the lights. Turn down the lights. <laughs> um, each light represents a different aspect of your life. So now imagine you're at home and Krishna's coming over at 5.15 in the morning and you're getting ready. And you're taking a shower, you got dressed. Tilak. Tilak Goti Korta. <laughs> Looking very nice. And now it's 5.15, right? And computer's off, everything's, you know, and Krishna's coming over and it's just you and Krishna. It's like, so just imagine what that would be like. You would not keep your computer going, the TV going, a book open, phone on. So you're entering in this process where all your attention has to go to Krishna, and it can't go to Krishna unless everything else is on. So some, in some way you have to make that adjustment in your mind. And just, just like turn it off. And it will become so natural after a while that it will just happen. As soon as you start chanting, just everything will blank out. It's just you and the holy name. That's all. That's the idea. You and the holy name, nothing else. So just practice and see. If you have any questions, you can ask me. Just practice it tomorrow. And, and you'll have to do it during chapter. Don't think just because the lights went out, someone didn't come and turn them on. They'll, they'll come back on for a while. No, I'm chanting Japa, turn them off. Well, you catch yourself thinking about something that has nothing to do with Japa, just turn it off. So, I'll come back later. We can deal with that later. If you're reading a book, watching a movie, doing work, you turn everything off so you can focus. So you know how to do it. You've done it before. You see, one of the problems is, when we don't have a taste, we like to turn the lights on to keep us entertained. Isn't it? Well, you know, I don't like chanting, so I'll think about you know, my service. I'll think about something, you know, get through the next two hours. That's the problem. Does that make sense? So that's part of the problem. We're not, it's almost like we're resistant to just hear and absorb. So we allow the mind to get distracted. Yes. 
Can you please tell some tips how to uh, help the kids to chant Buddha? Yeah. Oh, that's easy. That is so easy. All you have to do is chant good job for yourself. <laughs> and they see that. Now imagine you're a kid and you're looking at some adult chanting japa and it looks something like this. I'll do a demonstration. Um, I like to act. I actually studied acting. So I don't get that much chance to act, so now I'll act. And this, is, uh, this acting is based on reality because I've seen a devotee chant like this. And you may have seen devotees chant this. So if you can't see me, move around so you can see me. So imagine you want your kids to chant japa and you chant like this. Are you Krishna? Are you Have you seen devotees chant like this? And you tell your kids, chanting is so nice. <laughs> You know, and I, I did two things with my daughter. I would share my realizations from Japa. I never asked her to chant, I would just say, I just had a really good Japa this morning, I want to share what I was experiencing. I'd always share. And then sometimes I would say, can you chant with me because you inspire me when I, I try to get her to chant. I like to chant with you because I get inspired. My rounds are better when I chant with you. And then I'd get her to chant with me and I'd say, so what are your realizations? So she's thinking, okay, I'm supposed to have some real I've got to chant better because I don't have any right now. So it was, you know, it's all positive. But I, I think the um, example is, you know, you're chanting every day, you're relishing it, you're talking about how sweet it is. That, that's the best way. But, you know. I call that other chanting constipation jhapa. It looks like a person has constipation. Basically, it looks like he can't get it out. And I'm sure we've all seen people chant that way. You imagine you brought some new person to the temple, and all the devotees were chanting like that. They run out of the temple. Um, there was one author who said something pretty <laughs> profound. He said, your children don't listen to what you do, uh, what you say, they listen to what you do. You, you know, I don't know if you realize this, but when Prabhupada started the movement, because there were no other devotees, the only way people became Krishna conscious, it was like Prabhupada was bigger than life. He was all of this God. And he encompassed so much Krishna consciousness that what people now see today all through Iskand, they were just seeing in Prabhupada. It was one person had to give so much Krishna consciousness. And he had so much, and they could all see that he had something that was very special. And they wanted it. They didn't know what it was. But they could see he had something and they wanted it and that's why they became devotees. So if your kids can see you're getting something from your japa, then let them know what you're getting. Then maybe they'll be interested. <coughs> Say, I just had this amazing experience. I can't even explain it. What it was. I can't even tell you. Don't tell me, tell me. No. I don't think I could. It's too amazing. I mean, you're going to have to experience it yourself. And you can see, every kid is different. So, so I think we should probably stop. Should stop? All right. I mean, I can go longer if you have questions. Or we can do kirtan or what? Or both? Or, yeah. Anyone else have any questions? Comment? Yes. This might be a funny or stupid question, but I still have it because I, I had experience living in an ashram temple. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because temple is supposed to be the place where you chant with round. Right. But then during Japa, the devotees used to, you know, to speak something. Oh, talk. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So how, like, in a sense, if we uh, just ignore them mm -hmm. and don't speak with them or don't react to them, so this might upset. 
you know, it's said the devotee, so yeah. it's... So how to deal with it? How to deal with it? Yeah, so how do we... Well, you can buy one of my... I have many Joppa products. And one of my Joppa products is a button. And it says, it's on your bead bag, really big. It says, when my hand is in my bag, talking to you is a drag. <laughs> so when, you know, someone's trying to talk to you, you just go like this. <laughs> You go to my website, japaparaphernalia.com. We have many protective devices for good japa, you know, such as blindfolds and earplugs, different kinds of t-shirts, you know, keep, keep people away from you. Um, I think it's a good idea uh, to have a button like that. You may want to put it in your own words, that might be offensive, but... If you see my hand in my bag, um, I made a vow not to talk to anybody. Excuse, excuse me if I ignore you until I finish my vow. What I would suggest, every temple has a policy in their temple room, no talking is allowed during Japa. It's just if you want to talk, go outside. So as long as you're inside, nobody can talk to you. <clears throat> Mona Brat, 5.10 to 7 p.m., 7 a.m. every morning, Mona Brat in the temple. I think that would really help. Personally. So if you have this problem in your temple, maybe you can see if you can enact that policy. And you can buy the Mona Brat sign on my website. <laughs> Mona Brat, 5.10 to 7 a.m. Mona Brat means no talking. <coughs> During our Japa time, some other senior Vaishnava comes to us and asks us to do service. <laughs> you want to get me in trouble now. <laughs> he wants to know if you're chanting Japa and some senior Vaishnava comes and asks you to do service. <laughs> You're going to say, Mahatma Prabhu <laughs> All the lights are off. I've turned off all my lights, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you could wear, cover your eyes, put earplugs in, and pretend you haven't heard him. Um, <laughs> But we're asking for service when we're yeah. We're asking for service after seven. <laughs> you know, I would think is what I would think is if that service could be done at another time, I would negotiate that. If it can't, then yeah, you'll have to do it, and you know you can talk about it later. Yes. In all the seminars, it says the devotee doesn't defend himself. Ну вот ты начитал мантру, идешь такой спокойный, в благости тебе хорошо. And you chanted your rounds, you go and you feel good. К тебе подходит другой преданный и говорит, что ну ты такой сякой, я люблю тебя вообще, у тебя там нет мантры, служение твое отвратительное. Then comes another devotee and disturbs you with different offending words, mean words. Ты говоришь, окей. And you say, fine, don't define yourself. And you go home and cry. <laughs> Is that the question? The question is how to correctly deal with situation. So just say, fine, but, but inside you feel hurt. Oh yeah, okay. So she's saying it. Everything's good, you chant a good rounds, and on your 16th round someone comes and offends you. And now you're upset, but you're not supposed to retaliate. So how do you deal with it? <clears throat> well, how to deal with it is one thing, and can you deal with it the way we're supposed to deal with it is another thing. So it's easy to explain how to deal with it. Thank you, Prabhu. 
I am so puffed up that unless people like you come and offend me, I would never become humble. So thank you for pointing out my defects, because I'm so proud, I only see other people's defects, I never see mine. And uh, thank you, Mahaprabhu, for helping me realize Trinadapi Suni Chenam, because without sending this devotee to me, I would never realize. That's how we're supposed to feel. But because that's pretty elevated, um, the the way I would like to deal with this is to understand we have to learn how to not act upon feelings which would cause us to act in ways that aren't Krishna conscious. So I wouldn't say you shouldn't feel that way because it's natural you would feel that way until you're more advanced. But the question is now, because I'm not advanced and I do feel offended, how, how am I going to process that in a way that doesn't degrade my consciousness? Okay, so now this person has offended me, I feel offended, so, so now, now we're talking about emotional maturity. This is how I feel. What, am I going to act according to how I feel if those feelings will be problematic? So that's the challenge. So what's, what, you want to look at it this way, a, devotee A did something wrong, and now I feel bad. Is my reaction going to be on the same level as devotee's action towards me? In other words, am I going to allow devotee A to degrade my consciousness because of the way they acted? That's the problem. So, you know, the saying, two wrongs don't make a right. So that's the challenge. Well, you know, you could say, well, I feel bad and I'm justified in how I feel, and I might even be justified by retaliating. For in the material sense, yeah, you would be justified. But spiritually, you're just degrading yourself. So it's not helping you. So the way I personally look at it is that when those things happen, I always think, I'm in the material world and this is what happens here. And if I don't like that, I should go back to Godhead. That's how I think. Sounds funny, but it's true. Yeah. Prabhu, this happened and that happened. Well, all I can say is, if you don't like that, just go back to Godhead because it won't happen there. And as long as we've chosen to come in this world, these things do happen, even in the association of the Buddha. But it's better that we learn how to deal with it in a way that we don't become offensive. If you become offensive to that devotee, even though they're offensive to you, you're going to get a reaction for being offensive to them. You know, you, you might say, I'm justified in being defensive, offensive. That's okay, but you're going to get a reaction for being offensive, even you're justified. That's the problem. So we want to learn to be able to control our response. You know, there's a nice definition of forgiveness. It said, if you forgive somebody, you're withholding a response, a hurtful response, which they deserve because they hurt you. And then you're giving them a kind response, which they don't deserve. But what happens? You elevate yourself by giving them a kind response. You degrade yourself by giving them a hurtful response, even though you could be justified because you're just retaliating for what they do. Now, if you look at the behavior of pure devotees, they never respond in a negative way to people who treat them negatively. They always respond in one way, with kindness and compassion. That's the only, that's the only response they give. So, that's the example. You know, what's the right... There's a way to act that's right in spite of how people act towards us. Right? So, easier said than done, but that's, that's what we're supposed to do. And it is a fact that we're all proud, and it's nice when somebody points out our faults, because it reminds us that we're, we are proud. And there are people around us who are going to let us know when we do something wrong, and so we should feel grateful.
You know, I joke with the sannyasis, I say, you know, you have such a hard time. Because you like you're surrounded by people who are like, Maharaj, you are the best thing since apple pie. And, you know, your classes are amazing. I've never heard classes like that in my life. It's just every step you take, every word is just perfect. Whereas if you're a grihasta, People could say that, but when you get home, you get a reality check. <laughs> All right, come off your cloud, wash the pots, you, know, you left the mess, go clean it up. <laughs> so I joke with the sannyasis, I say, you know, I don't know how you can be humble, because you're not married. <laughs> I just feel really bad for you. I don't think you'll ever become humble, because there's no one to make you humble. And, you know, that's funny, but I'm totally serious. So if my wife, you know, my wife sometimes joke with me, I'll travel, you know, like, I'll come back after a month, she'll go, okay, time to come down. <laughs> got a lot of trash here. And I'm like, thank you, Krishna. It's like, so good. Because otherwise I would think I was somebody special. Now I can take the trash. Wow, that's a blessing. Just take the trash out. You don't realize how much I like taking trash. And it's so good, because when I go home, there's no disciples. And if there are disciples, they're not going to let me take the trash. So I get to take the trash. We're, we're not any special. We're nothing special. So we feel grateful. Those poor sannyasis, I don't know. They're going to make it back to God in this life. They don't have wives. It's going to be tough. So, you know, you can always appreciate when somebody just like this. Okay. See it as Krishna, if you can. Keeping you humble. I mean, that's how I take it. No, but I have to tell you, my God sisters, they keep me humble also. God brothers, they don't do it. God sisters, two or three times a year, they throw it at me. You shouldn't have said that in class. Why? <laughs> That's the nature of women, <laughs> sisters, and it's okay because I have an older sister, so she does it to me. So I had one god sister in last year, and I was giving class, and I was making all these points. And she's like, "You're making these points, but you're not giving the references." I can't stand that. You have to give the references. It's not good, you know. It's every point is your reference. <laughs> <laughs> she's from New York and she's Jewish you know, so. <laughs> little and she came back an hour later and said did I offend you? was I too heavy? and I go no I have a sister it's, you know, I'm used to it so that's I appreciate it that's good <laughs> I'm just being honest I do appreciate it okay. so what we have, we have kirtan now? Five minute break. Everyone's been sitting. Should we stand up? Or? We can have a break. If we, uh, if we want to carry on, we can have a break. Why don't we have a break and does I need to yes. go to the bathroom? We have a break and then we do kirtan? Five or ten minutes? You can stand up and get some water or something. Or stretch your legs. Yeah. <laughs>